Let's change gears for a moment. It's time to talk about 16S rRNA sequencing. And this is certainly one of the, the most extensive uses of amplicon sequencing. Most frequently, people who are interested in doing 16S rRNA sequencing are focused on diversity. They want to understand what the distribution of species in a certain location, in a certain sample, would be. So 16S rRNA is a, a very uh, is a region that has diverse regions and highly conserved regions next to it that allow us to, uh, to, to measure this very common region of microbial diversity. Um, and one of the reasons that we do this is to get at something that we frequently call an OTU. That's an operational taxonomic unit. Now, you find a lot of people kind of sloppily calling an OTU a sequence, and that's not quite what it is. So let's let's try to be a little more precise in how we use the term. An OTU is going to be our definition, essentially, for a, a sequence for which we find a lot of very close relatives. So we're going to seek the most common sequences in a sample and try to group them by similarity. So in, by convention, what we're going to do is find some sequence that has a whole cloud of other sequences that are at least 97% similar to it uh, surrounding it. By convention, we'll call that OTU essentially one species, but of course you're going to have some amount of, uh, of species that are uh, more genetically diverse than that, and some that are much narrower in their diversity as well. So this 97% rule uh, is, is largely just a rule of thumb that we so frequently see applied. So when we evaluate the diversity of, uh, of the, the species that are present in a sample, we typically call that an alpha diversity. So you have one sample. Within this one sample, I see 600 different OTUs. That would be one statement of, uh, of alpha diversity. But typically, when people are doing a microbiome, uh, they are, they're evaluating a whole range of different tissues. Maybe they are a, a whole range of different uh, environments. So perhaps they're doing a, a microenvironment of acid mine drainage, and they have located pools from different parts of runoff from a mine. They've sampled each of them, and now they're asking how the species diversity differs among these four or five puddles of drainage that they've been able to detect. Okay, so when we compare the diversity between different sites, we tend to refer to that as beta diversity, so alpha and beta diversity. There's also a, a grouping that we call gamma diversity, but it's, it's a little less accessible to us because gamma diversity is an attempt to capture the diversity of all, uh, of all the species found throughout a complex environment, and that is uh, that's a little like the population, whereas the sample uh, is, is, like a, is drawn from that population. So, in effect, when, when we talk about diversity operationally, we're talking about alpha diversity, the, the diversity within a particular sample, and beta diversity, differences between multiple samples. Now, how do we do this? We're going to try to walk through a timeline of three different tools, Mother, Chime, and Uparse. Now, in this video, I, I realize that my video is covering uh, the, uh, the icon for Chime, but we'll, we'll just go with that for the moment. I, I think that the icon design for Mother is, is one of the most beautiful examples of a software uh, logo I've ever seen, actually. I think it's a very, it feels like a very caring uh, logo. That's not something you find very often. So Mother was the first out of the gate. It was published in 2009, uh, and it was designed specifically for people who were moving away from old school sequencers and, and switching to the use of next generation sequencing. So being able to scale to millions of different sequences was absolutely essential for that, for that purpose. One of the, uh, the most common tasks that we encounter in this is to create a histogram. Essentially to say, how many different sequences do I observe uh, in the 16S rRNA region? So if I have a very large number of distinct sequences, and none of them are really uh, present, uh, present dominantly, I, I would say something went pretty wrong. Because generally speaking, 
uh, you're going to find that a few sequences are much more common than others. So counting how many times the sequencer uh, produces a 16S rRNA sequence that uh, aligns with one that's already seen, it's going to add votes to essentially how significant uh, the OTU that gets built from that, that cluster of sequences, uh, it, it's, it's an upvote to say this OTU accounts for more of the population of species found at this location than do the others. So by histogramming the different sequences, by simply counting how many times each is observed, uh, we're able to sort of get an assessment of the, their relative importance in the sample. It is able to cluster OTUs at different distance thresholds. Now you remember in just the last slide I said that the rule of thumb is that sequences must be 97% similar before we say that they are uh, that they belong to the same OTU. So it might be that 97% works just fine for this data set. Or it might be that you have much more diversity than you expected. In a case like that, you need to loosen up that from this 97% criterion. And then finally, uh, Mother had this ability to report diversity on that basis. So Mother was a, a pretty fully featured toolkit, uh, even in its original publication back in 2009. Now Chime uh, liked those ideas very much, but the folks behind Chime thought it would be a whole lot simpler if you could alter different aspects of how this analysis were done. What if you would like to change the visualization system that was tied to this OTU finding process? Well, Chime makes that kind of substitution quite easy. So uh, by, uh, by making an open, a more modular pipeline, Chime was able to make it possible for developers to alter some small parts of these pipelines and thus end up with kind of a, a more diverse software ecosystem for measuring biological diversity. And then finally, we get to uParse in 2013. Uh, uParse is another example of commercial software uh, in this space. The, the author for uParse had uh, some, some pretty clear notions of what was going wrong with existing software for mapping next-gen sequencing data to operational taxonomic units. Uh, and he argued that one of the first things we've got to do is get rid of singletons. Now a singleton uh, is the same as a sequence for which you have only one read. So you might imagine if we're speaking in mother's terms, uh, we're going to say that in, a hist in our histogram, it's a sequence that appears only once. It's got a count of one associated with this sequence. Uparse argues that looking at these sequences is, nothing, is going to add nothing but misery to your life. So throw them out. Simply throw out all of those and look only at reads for which you have multiple entries. That's uh, a pretty clear-cut way of getting rid of a lot of noise that might other be otherwise be introduced by individual sequences. The other problem that they highlight is that of chimeras. A chimera happens when you have two different pieces of DNA that have been stuck together inappropriately. Um, so you might imagine, for example, um, a gene fusion that occurs in the process of cancer, where two different genes from different parts of the genome get stuck together inappropriately, and it leads to some really badly behaved tumors. So chimeras, in this case, would be sequences that have been stitched together from different OTUs into one piece of DNA. Well, obviously, if you're going to cluster something like that with other bits of DNA, you're going to introduce a lot of problems. And so uParse has the ability to recognize these chimeric sequences and thus reduce the errors that they can possibly introduce. So that's brilliant. Now we have, sorry, now we have tools that can uh, handle our NGS data, cluster them, give us measurements of diversity, and so on. But we really need to have one more tool, and that is the ability to look up a particular 16S rRNA sequence and get back a biological explanation for what it is. It's all fine and good to have the OTU, but the OTU is a lot more valuable to you if you can assign a, a, a genus and species to it, in, in the best case. Now, sadly, a lot of the reference taxonomies for 16S rRNA really struggle um, to be able to deal with really exotic 16S rRNA sequences. If you can sequence, if you can, if, sorry, if you can culture an, an organism, if it's been fully sequenced, then yes, we're going to be perfectly good at matching that cluster, that OTU, to a, a taxonomy. But if it's a sequence that you've pulled from, say, the ocean, where we haven't sequenced as many different critters, uh, you may have a big problem uh, in trying to interpret what that OTU is biologically. 
So the Ribosomal Database Project was one of the first published in this space. It was first published back in 1997. Uh, it was, it's, it's now grown to more than 3.3 million 16S rRNAs. So that's pretty good, right? A, a huge number of microbes all represented. Uh, and yet we also see it has 126,000 28S rRNAs. Now, what would we use that for? Well, I believe in this case, this represents fungal uh, ribosomal sequences. They have a different, uh, a different weight attributable to the sequence uh, that we use uh, it, it, from our RNA for this purpose of OTU mapping. So Ribosomal Database Project is going to give you both kinds of, of, of uh, ribosomal RNAs. Now, Green Genes uh, has done a, a fair amount of work in order to support OTU mapping specifically. And one of the things that they did back in 2006 was to draw attention to this problem of chimeric sequences. And they did a, a, quite a lot of work to try to make sure none of those chimeric uh, ribosomal RNA sequences made it into their database, or rather to throw them out. Uh, Silva, in 2007, grew from another software toolkit called ARB. Uh, and uh, you can see that they ha also have diversified the sequences that they include. It's not just a bunch of ribosomal RNA, but it also uh, includes some small and large subunit sequences, uh, so you have this greater diversity. So which of these three databases you should use is probably going to depend on what kind of uh, taxonomic units you're, you're most interested in working with. If you're interested on, uh, in, in fungi rather than microbes, then you might want to steer your attention to a database that has a large number of 28S sequences in addition to 16S uh, sequences. Now the next piece of this is kind of a statistical question. Um, we've sequenced a bunch of species from some sample, but did we do enough? Are there more sequences there that we could have gone after? Uh, so we're going to use a technique frequently uh, called rarefaction analysis. So this starts off of the, the principle that we can rarefy our data. So if we start with the full set of the data, we might bootstrap out a subset. We can subset this uh, collection of spectra and grab maybe 50% of them or 70% of them or 30% of them. And from each of these smaller subsets, we can ask how the diversity looks. So uh, as we as we see in this quote from a 2013 article, rarefaction curves can be used to understand the depth of sampling of a community compared with its total diversity. Now you might expect that if you used an old school sequencer and, and generated just hundreds of sequences, not millions of them, uh, that you would have a much lesser sampling of, of, the, of the broader diversity of that, com of that community. Uh, if, on the other hand, you're using millions of sequences, you might assume that you're seeing next to everything. But what if you find that looking at 90% of your data suddenly cuts back on the number of uh, taxa, the, the number of OTUs you produce very dramatically? That would be very worrisome. You want to see that rarefaction doesn't change the number of species you observe, the, the number of OTUs you observe very, very significantly. So by scaling back the amount of data that we use, we get a sense of how complete a sampling did we do in this sample. 